All right. With that, let's welcome David Krellin to give us a talk about Science Scope. Round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Um, so actually, I'm going to talk about three projects that we're doing in Singapore. Um, uh, Basically, uh, my company has divide, developed a range of over 50 sensors. Um, and that's resulted in us getting interested in Internet of Things at school. We, we basically uh, developed all of our kit around schools. And we were fortunate enough to run a big project in the UK, uh, really inventing what Internet of Things at school might look like. Uh, and that's been followed by projects both in Peterborough and one that we're running in Singapore at the moment. And that's an open data platform um, where uh, people can access data from schools around the UK and in Singapore. Uh, we're also a tier one partner for the BBC Microbit project. Uh, and we're also developing another project jointly with the IoT Academy called Buggy Air, which is about measuring air quality uh, on children's buggies and we're doing some work on that in Singapore at the moment as well. Uh, so that, as I say the projects are Internet of School Things that we did with the UK government about two years ago now. We've moved that project to uh, Singapore uh, and doing work here on that um, buggy air and the microbit. And so in terms of what the kit is. Uh, this is a device which uploads data to the web, um, sens sensor data, and there's an air quality weather station on the other side which is deployed at uh, five schools in Singapore and uh, uh, about 25 schools in the UK, 30 schools in the UK at the moment. And what do you get out of this? You get a lot of data. This is all available for anyone to look at. At the end of my slides you can uh, hook into the data if you want to look at what's going on in Singapore and uh, in the UK. Um, and the, the slide here demonstrates what you can sort of understand from the data. The whole idea of this is to get kids interested in big data. Rather than just measuring one or two data points in the lab, uh, they can uh, actually look at some real data from real sensors measuring accurate data. And the point about this data I've got here is that you can actually see quite clearly that when it rained on one side, of, well actually it rained here in Singapore, which is actually Bukit Timar, um, the other side of Singapore, no rain at all, but you can see that there were some quite interesting temperature effects. The temperature fell quite rapidly at Bukit Timar, um, and that temperature fall actually was then mirrored across the other side of Singapore a bit later on, which is quite an intriguing thing and could be studied in a lot more detail, obviously. This is another example of the sort of thing you can understand from the data that we're generating. Um, everybody I speak to thinks of Singapore as being a hot and humid climate, and that second word is quite important. It's very humid here, isn't it? Don't we all agree it's really humid? But on the left-hand side, you see a humidity sensor from the UK. And what you notice about that is it's usually more humid in the UK than it is in Singapore. Why doesn't it feel humid in the UK? Because it's stupidly cold at the moment. <laughs> and we don't feel humidity unless it's actually very warm. So, you know, again, it gives you an opportunity to understand what we mean by uh, things like humidity and why it's not necessarily the same thing all the time. So I'm going to move on rapidly to talk about bug buggy air. Uh, this is a project where we're helping parents and carers to understand how ground level air pollution uh, affects their children. Using similar technology to that that we're using uh, on the Internet of School Things project, we're measuring things like uh, nitrogen dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide and particulates. Singapore's got quite a serious problem with uh, pollution, particularly when the haze is around. And we thought it would be really interesting to come out here and see what uh, ground level air pollution was like. So that's why we're doing a project here at the moment. Uh, this is very much of a sort of um, community led project. Uh, so the high idea is that we get communities of people borrowing the equipment and taking it around 
and actually investigating uh, their environment. Uh, the sorts of kit that we've got is demonstrated here. We've got the families who uh, have taken part in the project in London. Uh, we've built 10 sets of kit for them to take round. So there are 10 sets of this uh, stuff um, that we're using um, um, and measuring that sort of pollution data in different environments. Uh, London's another city that suffers quite seriously from uh, toxic gas, air pollution and also particulates. The sensing technology is moving on all the time and nowadays it's possible to produce devices which are not necessarily as good as uh, the static sensors there are by the road um, with, you know, costing tens of thousands of pounds but they're certainly measuring reasonably accurately and so give a good comparative but also tell you that data that you're exposed to as opposed to what the fixed sites are exposed to. So I want to move on finally, a majority of my talk will be about the, uh, the BBC microbit. Uh, this is a BBC microbit um, and earlier I programmed it to say something um, it's got a 5x5 five five, um, uh, matrix uh, LED display. Uh, this is a brand new coding device. We, together with th uh, 29 other partners, have actually designed this product with the BBC. And what we're doing with it, which is quite transformational, is we're going to give one to every student in a UK school uh, in... A, a month or so, well actually within the next uh, couple of weeks um, all kids uh, aged 11 in the UK are going to get one of these things. One of the things I get asked most of all about this is what's different about this from the Raspberry Pi or Arduino for that matter and what's different about it is that it's a standalone computer. You can actually have a battery pack for it and as a standalone device you can actually make it do useful things. If I gave you a Raspberry Pi, and even with a power supply, actually you can't do anything with it at all. You need a screen, a keyboard, a mouse, and all sorts of other things to add to it to make it do anything at all. What's quite remarkable about this is how versatile it is with the 25 LED display. It's also got an accelerometer, a compass, and temperature sensors, and it's got two buttons. Well, that's not quite a keyboard, but again, it's quite surprising how much you can do with two buttons. Uh, one of the, what I've actually programmed to do, you probably, I think it's probably too far away to see, but I've, pro I've programmed it to say, welcome to Foss Asia. Uh, and if I hold it this way up, it says, welcome to Foss Asia. If I hold it upside down, it starts saying, uh, in upside down, by the way, so it's really hard to read. Uh, but it says, welcome to Foss, Foss Asia upside down because it's really easy to program that because I can just use some code which I'll just show you briefly let me show you the programming environment so the programming environment is all in the web this is actually some code written in touch develop uh, you can write in a blocks language rather like uh, scratch uh, and you can see the code that I've written it's pretty straightforward anyway so you saw the programming environment uh, it's all in the cloud, so everything about programming it is in the cloud. Uh, you don't need any drivers or anything. It actually appears as a, um, a, a memory stick when you plug it into your computer, so you can just download the code to it uh, from a file that comes down from the browser. Um, you can also use it with Android and iOS devices. Uh, we've actually been developing the iOS platform uh, system and Samsung have been developing uh, the programming environment for the Android uh, platform. You've got a choice of code editors. Uh, there's JavaScript, uh, Block Editor, which I mentioned earlier, Touch Develop, which I've just seen, shown you, and uh, there's also a MicroPython uh, editor. We've actually been working in Singapore on taking this concept into schools here and these are actually some photographs of some work we were doing earlier on in the week uh, where we had 15 kids from three schools across Singapore playing with the microbit on the left hand side learning how to code it 
On the right hand side they made it into a soil moisture sensor with a few wires and some nails. So again you can add things to it really easily. There's a whole lot of holes in it which are connections. You can actually use them as buttons in effect because they've, uh, they, they're like got the makey makey touch sensitive feature. Uh, but they can also both uh, read analog data, output digital data, read digital data, all sorts of things you can do very easily with it. So if you want to follow up on any of these projects, um, the Internet of School Things is at our exploratory, which is exploratory.sciencescope.uk. Um, the micro bit is discussed in our news page or on our website. Uh, and the work that we've been doing on um, uh, Buggy Air is being led by the IoT Academy. So that brings an end to my formal talk. If anyone has any questions that they want to ask uh, about um, either the microbit or any of the other projects we're working on, I'm well, uh, more than happy to take a few questions. Um, so is this available for public to buy? Uh, it will be available for the public to buy, buy very shortly, yeah. Um, within the next couple of months, we'll actually have them available to buy. And how much would it cost? Uh, it's going to, um, what it'll cost in this region, I can't be absolutely clear about. In the UK, we're going to be selling it for around about uh, 12 pounds, which is about 24, 25 Sing dollars. And I noticed uh, on one of the screens, that you, that you require to use a Microsoft product to program the... Uh, Touch Develop is a Microsoft programming environment, but you can also use Python, uh, JavaScript, and the Blocks Editor. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah? The, um, the curricula for... Uh, you're you, you giving to this to all kids in the uh, UK, 11 years old, right? Yeah. So, um, how this is done in the, in the practice, in the, in, the, in the school, in the, in the courses, how this is uh, presented to kids? Uh, so, in the UK, we've um, developed our computing curriculum substantially, so all kids now have to study coding to some extent. So, these kids will have to study coding. Uh, the teachers are getting a lot of support from a number of uh, organisations such as the Internet, uh, Institute of Ele um, Elect Electronics and Technology, um, something called Computers at School are providing a lot of training and resources for the teachers, so there's a huge amount of resources on the Microbit website for using it in education. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? If not, I will finish up there. Thank you very much.